down. Straight left from Harold Reyes. And for, to the face of Harold Reyes, I mean Antonio Russell. Body shot from Russell. Russell looks like he's starting to slowly break down Harold Reyes. Two big uppercuts to the hard left, and down goes Reyes. He got spun around, and this fight is over. Spectacular. Just as I said, he was breaking down Harold Reyes. He landed a huge shot and down went Reyes and he was knocked out. Oh, oh goodness me, what a punch. Reggie Johnson landing William Gutter with a right hook. Goodness, look at the state of him. He's not going to beat the count. Round five, what a punch. Your daily take, always a compelling watcher, right here on Sports Extra on Africa Independent Television. Okay, now, the boxing heavyweight class has been embroiled in a lot of controversy of late over the years. It almost seems to run like forever. But now, the latest one is the fact that uh, uh, Vladimir Klitschko versus uh, Anthony Joshua is not seeing the light of day because of controversy. Hey, those who are running the sport at the highest level have to actually sanitize the house and make it decent, okay? And this is where we drop the anchor on today's edition of the show. Tomorrow will be another day and another time right here. We'll be back with another package. On behalf of everyone here, Basi Emmanuel here, to have yourself a great day. personality interviews all is come with an open mind that way you know anything can happen it's all about events both social and corporate whenever wherever is taking place personality places and events wants to be part of it my name is a tire where you saw Yours truly, Ovation, on TV, where we bring you all the exciting information and, of course, entertainment around the world. Join us as we unravel these subgenres that have shaped the Afro pop phenomenon. It's a musical experience. Right now, the cultural drive that our people are expressing is getting to the world.
Nigeria is officially back on the list of polio endemic countries in the world, joining Pakistan and Afghanistan, which are the only two countries still reporting polio cases. This follows the outbreak of new cases of the white polio virus in Borno State, Northeast Nigeria, two years after the transmission of the virus was disrupted in the country. We are told it will take another three years for Nigeria, which is the only country with polio in Africa, to get off the unenviable list and be certified polio-free. The cost to nurse a Nigerian child was, I think, about 4,000 naira for a child. But now that new vaccines are coming, the costs are gone up to 14,000 naira to fully immunize a Nigerian child. Most of you are aware that without the World Bank, we have not been able to immunize our children this year, part of last year, this year. And that money will exhaust by next year. And if it does exhaust, we can express stock out. As at this moment, all the new vaccines are actually paid for by Gavi. The recent outbreak which informed the fire brigade approach by head authorities in the country to contain the re-emergence of the white polio virus has been blamed on insecurity in the Northeast, occasioned by the seven-year-old deadly activities of the terrorist group Boko Haram. But it is always convenient to look for excuses to explain the failures of the government and the country, which accounts for 2% of the entire population of the world, even when the realities are very glaring. It's an open secret that the maternal mortality, infant mortality, and childhood mortality are all very poor in those areas, even before the insurgency. And the insurgency has only made it worse. But uh, the issue of accountability, patriotism, and uh, co commitment to service generally, and the improvement of human resource for health in these regions will go also a long way. Welcome to Straight Talk, Nigeria's development promotion program on television. I am TV Tiav in the Paduma Hill Studios at the AIT World Headquarters in Abuja, the Nigerian capital. The sorry state of healthcare in Nigeria is the story of failed primary healthcare services across the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. Let's now listen to Nigerians about their experience with primary health care facilities and services. To have a primary health care center which is close to my house. I have been there once but um, the service is somehow low because of uh, the manpower. It's not much but the place is very big and it's okay. But since I've been there I went with a friend but we later we did not go again. Do you know the primary health care center? That is in Malaba. No, I don't know there. But I'll be here now. The, play, uh, the primary health care. The year 2017 makes it 25 years after the federal government acting on the recommendation of a high level review team of the World Health Organization, WHO, established the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, NPHCDA. Through Decree 29 of 1992, now an act of the National Assembly. The agency, which as a child of necessity was in 2007 merged with the National Program on Immunization, MPI, was deliberately set out to address the failures in primary health care delivery, which is considered the responsibility of local councils as the third tier of government in the country. In Nigeria, health is on the concurrent list. So it means it's, you know, that it's, it's everybody's responsibility. And you know the challenge when you say something is for everybody. You know, but in principle, we say that, you know, the 
area currency for the local governments are supposed to take care of primary health care, uh, states are supposed to take care of secondary health care, and federal government does this. But in reality, you know, that responsibility ends up being nobody's responsibility. You know, and the issue of autonomy of local governments, which should have run with this, also is an issue. So we are not getting it right. And truly, when you go around and you see what's happening at primary health care centers, the area councils clearly are incapable of managing and running those facilities optimally. A number of the primary health care facilities in the urban centers are relatively upstandard and offer services close to what is expected of them. The challenge is clearly in semi-urban centers and many rural communities across the Federation where there are either no facilities or those said to be provided are in dilapidated condition and without the required manpower to deliver services. In Nasarawa State, North Central Nigeria, where one is most times forced to even ask whether there is even a government, the Jankawa community in the Masaka area of the state, located off the ever-busy Abuja Kefi Expressway, is a typical example of what is wrong with the country's primary health care. Here, the facility was not only constructed through community efforts decades ago, the workers are volunteers. The problem here is that we are up to seven, but only one employed staff, almost all are volunteers. And you can see it's a problem there, it's a big problem there. We need actually people that are working directly with the government. There will be serious reasons. When I give out to my baby, it was at home because that time, this clinic is locked and the workers here, they don't use to work. At the night time like this, they used to go around six, seven because there's no equipment to work by that kind of time, and there's no light for them to be working till night time and daytime. We have also visited a Bakin Kogi Kaninko village in Jamar, local government area of Kaduna State, northwest Nigeria, where it took the intervention of a daughter of the community, the now late Dr. Hawa Kadima, who died in 2015, for a non-governmental organization to establish a functional healthcare facility in the community. They call this a clinic uh, here in Bakin Kogi, Kanikon, the Jama local government area of Kaduna State in northwest Nigeria. The community is just about 12 kilometers or there about away from Kafanchan, which is the local government headquarters. And what we've seen here is certainly not impressive. The public health care facility is said to have only one health worker with most of the rooms in the building now locked up and abandoned. With a very dirty environment, it is almost certain that it is suicide for anybody to visit this center for any form of medical attention. What it is now is only, um, what's her name, uh, Gloria Hassan, that uh, working, serving here now as a um, community uh, I mean, nurse. Uh, calling to the history that I hear to build this uh, clinic is reached 32 years now. But I grow, I see this clinic. There is nothing here. Again, the person now is not well. Then just take it to Kafanchan. Because when they leave her duty here, they will not get any person that he will help her, like, he will help her here. The story of primary health care facilities in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, is more worrisome. Especially that in a space of six months, there were outbreaks of strange diseases that claimed 23 lives, especially of children, in different communities across the territory. In Bwari Area Council of the Territory, 14 children died from an outbreak on February 19, 2016, while nine other persons were killed by another outbreak on August 5, 2016, in Damanganza community in Apo area of Abuja Municipal Area Council, AMAC. Authorities in the territory agree 
that in the many communities where they have failed to stop the unfortunate killing of twins and infanticide across the six area councils, there are no public or private healthcare facilities. And in other areas where they do exist, there are no health workers. The typical scenario is the situation where pregnant women without prenatal care do sometimes give birth to my phone names. In such cases, the babies are usually, hand, are usually handed over to the village deities and all mosques to take care of the important by the community elders. We have enough number of uh, primary health care centers. All that we need to do is to see how we can equip them and of course staff them so that they can be effective. Okay. Over time it has been bad. There is, however, a ray of hope for communities across the country, and thanks to the Board of Executive Directors of the World Bank, that on August 23, 2015, approved a 500 million US dollar International Development Association IDA credit to significantly improve maternal, child, and nutrition health services for women and children in Nigeria. The fund, which is to be expended over the four-year period of August 1, 2015 to December 2019, is in support of the Saving One Million Lives initiative launched by the Federal Minister of Health in October 2012 to save the lives of more than 900,000 women and children who die every year in Nigeria from largely preventable causes. As we speak, 55.5 million U.S. dollars of the money has been released with each of the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, on July 14, 2016, receiving the sum of 1.5 million U.S. dollars, equivalent to 420 million naira at the time. This is said to be seed money to the states and the FCT to revitalize the primary health care in their respective areas. And in the studio today, we have two guests who will be taking a critical look at uh, this very disturbing uh, national issue moving forward. I have uh, with me on my immediate uh, left, Dr. Dale Ogumbayo. He is a health a communications specialist uh, who will be sharing his experiences with us uh, as we, we move forward. We also have with us uh, Edwin Equeria, uh, who is the country director of one campaign uh, involved in health advocacy in Nigeria and indeed in other parts of the world. And here in Nigeria, uh, we shall be taking a look at uh, the issue of health. They do a lot uh, in the area of poverty. Uh, alleviation, poverty, eradication, and all of that. But on today's edition of the program, we shall be narrowing in on the issue of health in Nigeria. Gentlemen, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Primary health care is the basis. What's your assessment of what we have now? The structures that we have on ground now, are we making the best use of them? The amount of money that we have currently in the health sector, are we efficiently using it? Are we effectively using it? It is only when we have done that, we need to start thinking of efficiency of our expenditure, for instance, so that we're not just increasing budget and increasing the money that goes to private pockets. I mean, those, those are the real issues. I know, again, one of the fantasies of the average Nigerian is to keep threats to us and government, government. But for me, I think we've... We've done that enough. Many other people can still keep doing that. But we have to see how we can begin to whip ourselves as citizens yes. into line. Why are people in discipline? Why are people taking advantage of the poor back there at, at, at the rural no. areas? Why don't people come to work? You'll be shocked at the level of absenteeism of health workers no, no, no. in almost every city. That is not just government. Yes, government may be inept at sanctioning no, 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 no. people, but what about our own moral compass? Is it so derailed? You know, so. And, and I think that until the people take charge of issues about their health, begin to make demands of health practitioners, of health workers, and those ones will in turn begin to make demands of health policy makers who are their superiors. We're not going to have so many changes. So, but, so I'm sorry if I bust your bubble. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to say, oh, let's build more, let's buy more. 
Okay. It's okay. Um, but we're talking about the issue of budget yes. and putting money and all of that. I also know that uh, your organization has been involved in budget tracking, yes. monitoring, and seeing the uh, you know what what is what is what is on the ground. Are we putting? Definitely, we are not. We can't say we are putting enough resources, as it were. But what we have, the efficiency he's talking about. Are, are we heading okay. in that um, direction? I, I have various dimensions to come from. Uh, I agree, you know, to a large extent about the issues of efficiency. Um, I think one of the things that you need to take into consideration right now is that we have agreed that there is inefficiency. We have also agreed that there is gross mis there is mismanagement, there is corruption. We have also agreed that there is, but we also must agree that there is a real issue of um, inadequacy. That I mean, we cannot. So many things are at play here, and this is very important. You know, now we can talk about the efficient efficient use of resources, which is true. For instance, I give you quick quickly. Uh, of the total budget that have been allocated to the Ministry of Health and its agencies at the federal level, right? About 60%, 65% between 2013 and 2016 has actually been uh, released, right? Of the amount released, only about 55% um, <clears throat> have actually been um, utilized. Okay? I'm talking of annual budgets. Now, so we've seen those a level of inadequate uh, use of resource. But it is more important to understand that, first of all, when you put a budget and the, the release comes in at the tail end of the year, I'm, I'm giving this recently to give an example of um, what happens in the system until we have a crisis. So the point here is, in fact, coming to the issue of budget is the issue of how the resources are even allocated. So you have a budget, maybe in 2016, for instance, 250 billion naira was allocated to the Ministry of Health and its agencies. About uh, 12 billion was allocated for vaccines, right? In 2016, as of August, right? A dime had not been released. Then suddenly, there are two cases of polio in Borno from recovered territories, right? And the third one that just appeared now. Then suddenly all the monies are released because it's not a response to a crisis. That shouldn't, be, that shouldn't be the way things are done. I agree with him when he says we should be building systems. That is true. Those systems should be able to, should allow us be able to allocate the resources the way they should, be, they should be allocated, the time it should be allocated. Because for every time you make a mistake, people die. This is the difference in the health sector from other sectors. For every mistake you make, lives will be lost. And this is the point. For primary health care, for instance, all kinds of things are need to be available in the facility. It's not just about the personnel. It's about drug stockout. Aso Rock Clinic in recent time got a drug stockout. When I say Aso, I mean Aso Rock Clinic, the state the house. house yeah. Got a drug stockout. This is the one in the federal capital yeah, that the president is supposed to be using. And they have the highest budgets. And the okay, about 3.8 billion in 2016 got a drug stockout. Do you get my point? Systems are terrible. And that is the reason why, as you are putting resources, you should be creating systems that will create transparency. And let me give you another shocking fact, so maybe it's not shocking to you, is that of the total funding for health in Nigeria, the donors carry the biggest burden. Do you really know that? Mm -hmm. Even though we know the government spend a lot of money, but when you track donor money in the country that comes in every year to the health sector, you will be shocked. And the question is that if the federal government is not efficient in its own system, would, should the donors still not be efficient? Most recent, $1.5 million shared to all 36 states, right? Yes. You have that yes. on record. In Nigeria term, that is like 450 million naira shared, okay? Another tranche is supposed to have been released based on the result of the first one. Ask me, how many states has given any result? I don't know if you get that point here. So, my very case is that there are two things we need to deal with. The level of resourcing and the efficiency of the resource use. So you cannot take one and say the other, we should do one first. You should do both of them together. It is compulsory. Yes. On the list of 190 countries being a ranking of the world's health systems last produced by the World Health Organization, WHO, in year 2000, Nigeria placed fourth from the bottom. 
just better than Nyame, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Congo in that order. As we speak, Nigerians constitute 2% of the world's entire population, yet the country accounts for 14% of global maternal mortality. Records show that there are maternal cases of 576 in every 100,000 live births and an under 5 mortality of 128 per 1,000 live births. These indices remain worrisome. For instance, Nigeria is not only ranked fifth amongst countries with the highest burden of tuberculosis in the world, the country leads the rest of Africa with the highest number of TB cases. And while malaria officially accounts for 20% of deaths in the country, hepatitis B is fast becoming the leading cause of death, with a national prevalence rate of 10% said to be three times higher than that of HIV AIDS and diabetes, with no fewer than 20 million Nigerians living with hepatitis. How can the country turn around these depressing indices but most significantly and most importantly, save millions of lives through effective delivery of primary health care services. There is a need to define clearly roles and responsibilities for different tiers of government in terms of which health system. As we, as we speak now, you, you know that there are states that have been teaching what to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if your primary health care system is not working, is not in place, your second health care system is not in place, I mean, why would you be going to build the tertiary health facility and truly really go around to all of those states that have tertiary health that are good and see what's happening at that, that level? So I, I completely believe that there's a need for, you know, clearly defined roles and responsibilities for different types of government so that people are run specifically the responsibility that are meant for them and get it right. The religion to itself, and we have accepted here, we know the facts are there, that 60% of the care is really provided for by the private sector. Needless to say, to me, the government is responsible for the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. And it's not the case that the private sector is not responsible for the private sector. Sometimes, into primary health care itself. And look at the private sector as a complement, not good competition of many care. Then that extra 60% would have been brought on board. And now we can make progress. Any giant primarily is supposed to work best with primary health care delivery. But when we have a remote now who are not properly guided, being pushed and packaged into tertiary facilities, we are crippling the ones that have the capacity to also deliver primary medical care by not enrolling them how they can use to deliver the primary medical care. Healthcare uh, centers. I'm, I'm so concerned about that because if I have headache today, for instance, I will possibly be going to National Hospital, or be going to a Sokoro Hospital, or going to. I will not. I, I can't even. I, I'm not sure I know where the primary healthcare center <laughs> is where I, I, I stay. Is is that bad? Now, that's something that we need to adjust. Let me, let me tell you what happened. What I experienced in the states. So I won't say to Southwest about five years ago. What they did first to discourage people from coming to, to the general hospital or city hospital for is they had some level of subsidized health. But if you you'll only enjoy that if you come through the primary health care structure. If you come directly, you have to pay like ten times more. No no worries. And gradually people started learning that. So it's be better to go. But then again, it means that you must make the primary health care facility functional. Uh -huh. That's okay. Another thing they did was they had the communities shared amongst community, families and communities shared amongst their health workers. So I'm responsible for 10 families. He's responsible for 15 mm -hmm. families. And I regularly, I know who's diabetic there, who's hypertensive there. So I'm like a family physician. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a first point of contact. It's easy to bring programs to them. It's easy to convince them to come to hospital or to do antenatal or to do this or to do that. Now, that's a model. There are so many models. So which state is this? This was a Kitty state okay. wow. many years ago. Uh, I go and he was governor there or something. Okay. You know, and that for me was exciting. It doesn't 
such a program, you don't need more money. You really need more thinking. You really need more dedication. Well, and, and that can be replicated. Yeah. We are putting a lot of pressure on the infrastructure and the secondary health facilities, and the primary health facilities are just them. They are abandoned. When they are work functional, they are... So when they become more functional, then you can deploy more even senior resources. Mm. For instance, a doctor working in the, uh, in the local government could be given the assignment to cover, say, four primary health care centers in, in a community. Yeah, yeah. And he knows he has to be in this one yeah, on Monday, yeah. down on Tuesday, like that. And there are incentives. To there are incentives. There are ways to communicate. Yeah, yeah. So if there's a problem, they know what to do. You could have close user group phones for that yeah, community yeah. with that yeah. doctor. There are, there, there are different models that people could think with the, with the, There are different models, really. And the model that was adopted by the Federal Ministry of Health and MPACD recently involves the one where a primary health care center is actually supposed to also act more like a community mobilization center. Sure. So as much as we're investing in the treatment and care uh, component, of course we should also invest in the health promotion, in the, health, in the prevention you know, processes as well. Right now there is a crisis. We must intervene in the crisis. Otherwise, output or outcomes will not change, no matter what we do. And so these are the things we need to say. We balance them, health promotion, prevention measures, and then we attitude orientation. But resourcing and accountability must go along with every other thing that we are dealing with.